Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sani, our Professor Department Chair. This is going to be a demonstration of the cervical plexus and the ansa cervicalis on the right side of the neck. This is a supine cadaver. We are standing on the right side. So we have removed the sternocleidomastoid. This is the sternocleidomastoid. We have exposed the lateral cervical region here and the anterior cervical region here. This is the infratemporal fossa. We have removed the ramus of the mandible and all other related structures. We are showing the contents of the infratemporal fossa. And we have removed the clavicle here to show the root of the neck. This gives us a clear exposure to show you all the branches of the cervical plexus. The root value of cervical plexus is C12345. Now the cervical plexus has got a lateral component and an anterior component. The lateral component is the sensory part of the cervical plexus, more or less, and the anterior component or the medial component is the motor part of the cervical plexus, which is also called the ansa cervicalis. So let's take a look at the root of the cervical plexus first. The C1 is very high up. We cannot see, but you can see this root here. This is the C2 root. We can see this. This is the C3 root. This is the C4 root. Remember, in the cervical region, each spinal nerve comes out above the corresponding vertebra. Then we have this one here. This is the C5 root. Then we have this. This is the C6. This is the C7. And down below, this is the C8. And further lower down will be the T1, which we cannot see. Before I go to come to the cervical plexus, let me just quickly complete the trunks of the brachial plexus itself because we can see them here. So the C5 and the C6 roots unite to form the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. The C7 root continues as the middle trunk of the brachial plexus, and we can see that here. And the C8 and the T1 form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So this is the upper trunk, the middle trunk, and the lower trunk. These three trunks of the brachial plexus, they come out in this triangular region here, bounded posteriorly by this muscle. This is the scalenus medius, and anteriorly by this muscle, this is the scalenus anterior. So therefore, and lower down is the first rib. So therefore, this triangle is called the scalene triangle. So therefore, the trunks of the brachial plexus emerge through the scalene triangle where they can be potentially entrapped to produce what is known as the scalene syndrome. Having mentioned that, now let's come back to the cervical plexus itself. First of all, I would draw your attention to these intercommunications between the roots of the cervical plexus. We can see that the C1, C2 root, they form a loop. Then there's another loop between the C2, C3. There's another loop between the C3, C4. There's another loop between the C4, C5. These are the primary loops of the cervical plexus. This is a very unique feature of the cervical plexus. And emerging from the loops, we have these branches. These are the three branches. And I'm going to name them just now one by one. And I'm going to mention the distribution. So let's start off with the first one. We can see this one coming out here. This is the lesser occipital nerve. It's a small nerve which runs behind the ear. And it supplies the region behind the ear. Great auricular lesser occipital. This is the lesser occipital nerve. Then we have the next branch here. This is the great auricular nerve. The great auricular nerve runs across the sternocleidomastoid. Suppose the sternocleidomastoid had been here. It runs across like that. And then it supplies the skin of the lobule of the ear, the lower half anterior surface, and a little bit of the posterior surface. And then it also supplies the skin over the parotid gland and the separate glands of the parotid gland. This great auricular nerve is a very important nerve. This great auricular nerve is quite often injured during parotid surgery. And some surgeons actually cut the great auricular nerve and repair it later during parotid surgery. This great auricular nerve injury is one of the components which contributes to what is known as the auriculotemporal syndrome or the Frey syndrome or the gustatory sweating, which is seen in many cases after parotid surgery. This is the great auricular nerve. This great auricular nerve, it supplies the sweat glands, and that's why we get gustatory sweating. This great auricular nerve also carries pain fibers from the parotid sheath. So therefore, when there's a parotid inflammation, the pain is transmitted by the great auricular nerve. The next branch that we can see are these branches. They go across like this. From the lateral cervical region, they go and medially, and they supply the skin of the 
medial side of the neck as the anterior cervical regions. Therefore, this is called the transverse cervical. So we have seen great auricular, lesser occipital, transverse cervical. Most textbooks say that they are all C2, C3 roots. The transverse cervical supplies this region here. Then we can see this branch here. This is not one actually, there are several. This is the supraclavicular nerve and we can see several branches here. Supraclavicular is C3, C4. And this travels by means of several branches, notably a lateral and intermediate and a medial branch. It crosses the surface of the clavicle. Rarely it can go through the clavicle and it supplies the skin of the upper front of the chest. This supraclavicular nerve is the one which is responsible for referred pain to the shoulder when there's a diaphragmatic irritation. And I'll tell you why that is just now in a little while. This supraclavicular nerve can be injured when there's a fracture of the clavicle. This supraclavicular nerve is C3, C4, and we can see it is coming out from C3 and C4. The next branch that we can see here is this one here, and I'm going to lift up the lower portion of his first. This is the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is a mixed nerve, sensory and motor. The root value is C345, and we can see it is getting contribution from C5, it is getting contribution from C4, and higher up it gets comes from C3. So therefore, phrenic nerve typically is C345. This runs in front of the scalenus anterior muscle, and we can clearly see that here. And it was under the prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia. And then we can also see it is going behind the subclavian vein. This is the subclavian vein. It goes behind the subclavian vein, it enters into the thorax. And then it runs anterior to the pulmonary hilum. It supplies the pericardiophrenic, the fibrous pericardium, and goes down and supplies the diaphragm, motor fibers and sensory fibers. That, coming back to this concept of diaphragmatic irritation producing referred pain to the shoulder. The root value of phrenic nerve is C345. The root value of supraclavicular nerve is C34. So therefore, there is a commonality of root values between the T's two. So whenever there is diaphragmatic irritation, like for example, due to any connection of fluid or anything under the diaphragm or cholecystitis, the pain fibers, they are referred and they transmitted through the supraclavicular nerve and they produce referred pain to the shoulder because of the common root values C34 and C34. So that's about the phrenic nerve. Now let's take a look at the ansa cervicalis or whatever we can see of the ansa cervicalis. The, basically the word ansa means a handle. This ansa cervicalis has got two loops, a superior limb and an inferior limb. And I will show that to you just now. Take a look at this nerve here. This is the hypoglossal nerve. And we can see one branch is coming out from the hypoglossal nerve. This is the superior limb of ansa cervicalis. The superior limb of ansa cervicalis, it comes up from the loop of C1, C2. Let me describe the inferior limb first and then we shall talk about the ansa cervicalis as a whole. This is the, the inferior limb of ansa cervicalis. So therefore, to lift up the whole thing, this is the superior limb, this is the inferior limb of ansa cervicalis. The inferior limb of ansa cervicalis comes out by means of two roots from C2 and C3. The superior limb, which is also called descending hypoglossi, and the inferior limb is also called descending cervicalis. The two of them go down and they form a loop here, which is called the secondary loop, which is also called the loop of ansa cervicalis. This ansa cervicalis is actually the motor component of the cervical plexus, the superior limb and the inferior limb, the descending hypoglossi and the descending cervicalis. What does this do? Let's come back to the superior limb. The superior limb, which came from the C1, C2 loop, most of it, it runs with the hypoglossal nerve. This is the hypoglossal nerve going into the tongue, but it has got nothing to do with the hypoglossal nerve. Most of the fibers, they continue down as a superior limb of ansa cervicalis, and it forms the loop of ansa cervicalis. But some of the fibers, they continue with the hypoglossal nerve, and they supply the geniohyoid muscle in the floor of the mouth, and the thyrohyoid muscle from the thyroid to the hyoid. This is the thyrohyoid muscle. Some of the fibers from the superior limb, they travel back up with the hypoglossal nerve into the posterior cranial fossa. And they supply the meninges of the posterior cranial fossa. That is C1, C2. That is the reason why when we have an epithology in the posterior cranial fossa, it produces referred pain to the back of the head and the back of the neck because of the 
fibers from the C1, C2. When we have the complete formation of the loop of Ansa cervicalis, from the loop of Ansa cervicalis, it gives branches to the remaining infrahyoid muscles and the strap muscles of the neck, namely the sternohyoid, the sternothyroid, which is under that, the omohyoid. This is the superior belly of omohyoid, this is the inferior belly of omohyoid. So therefore, the, the ancestral cervicalis, the main purpose is to provide motor supply to the strap muscles of the neck. So that is about the ancestral cervicalis. Before I conclude, there's one more thing, one more point I wanted to mention to you about the sensory branches of the cervical plexus. I have held up all the branches of the cervical plexus here as a bundle. Imagine the sternocleomastoid muscle would have been here. They would have all emerged from the posterior border of the sternocleomastoid approximately at this region. So therefore this region, posterior border of the sternocleomastoid is referred to as the nerve point of the neck because we can theoretically potentially give a nerve block here in this region along the posterior border of the sternocleomastoid to anesthetize these four branches of the cervical plexus, namely the great auricular, lesser occipital, transverse cervical, and supraclavicular. And therefore, we can anesthetize this much portion of the neck, front, side, and the front of the chest. Therefore, this is referred to as the nerve point of the neck. We can determine the nerve point of the neck by locating the posterior border of the sternocleomastoid and seeing the midpoint of it, approximately here. Or, we can take the an imaginary line from the mastoid process and drop it straight down to the clavicle and taking the midpoint of that, that also will give us the nerve point of the neck. So these are the points which I wanted to mention to you about the cervical plexus and the answer cervicalis. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. Solomon is the camera person. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Please like and subscribe.